Hello everybody and welcome to another one of Mr. Deeping Science Lessons. For today's session you're going to need a book, a pen and two worksheets which you can download in the links below. In your book I'd like to get down today's title which is Ecosystems and Competition and for your starter activity I would like you to suggest which animal could live in this habitat. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time pause the video and when you're finished we'll continue the lesson together. Did you make some suggestions about what could live in this habitat? If you did, I'd like to know about it down in the comments below. Today we're going to define some of our key words, ecosystem, community, population, habitat, environment and niche. We're going to state what animals and plants compete for and we're going to describe the relationship between predator and prey. Our first key word is habitat and a habitat is the area in which an animal lives. Next we have a population which is a group of the same species within a habitat. In this picture we've got a population of zebra and we've got a population of wildebeest. Collectively all the animals of all the species living within a habitat make up a community. The factors that affect that habitat, things like rainfall, the amount of sunlight, the amount of wind and the amount of humidity are referred to as the environment. And when you combine that habitat and its environment and the community made up of those populations that live there, you have an ecosystem. Another key word which you probably won't encounter until GCSE is niche, which is an organism's role within an ecosystem. Take for example a tree. A tree provides food because it's a producer and it also provides shelter for animals like birds and insects. That tree's niche is to be a food source and to be a source of shelter. That is the tree's role within its ecosystem. What I want you to do is to match up these key words to their definition on the right hand side. And if you still want a challenge, I'd like you to explain what an ecosystem is. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. If you match them all up, let's have a look. Let's start with a population. This is a group of the same species that live within a habitat. A community is a collection of all the species that live within a habitat. The habitat itself is the area in which the animals live and the environment are all the factors that affect a habitat. If you've explained what an ecosystem is, it is important that you mention all four of these things. An ecosystem is a collection of all the populations of all the species that live within a habitat and the factors that can affect that habitat, which we call the environment. So now we have defined our keywords. Let's have a look at some of the things that animals will compete for. They compete for space, for both shelter and for hunting. They compete for food and water, and within the same species, they will also compete for mates. Plants also compete for space, space for their roots to spread out and space for their canopy to spread out. They also compete for food, but we don't say food when we're referring to plants, we say nutrients instead. They compete for water, and they compete for sunlight. For our next task, what I'd like you to do is explain, in terms of competition, why there are no other plants growing near this tree. And if you still need a challenge, I'd also like to explain why a bird can live in the same area as this tree. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time pause the video and when you're finished we'll go through the answers together. Have you got your explanation? There are no plants growing near this tree because these roots take up a lot of space. That means that they will absorb all of the nutrients and water from the surrounding soil. Other plants and seeds that try to grow here are outcompeted because they cannot absorb enough nutrients or enough water for photosynthesis. But why can a bird live in the same area? That's because the bird does not compete for the water or the minerals in the soil. The bird can fly elsewhere to get its water and food. The bird can even live in the tree. Remember, that's our tree's niche. So now we've stated what animals and plants compete for. And next we're going to describe the relationship between predator and prey. Here we've got a model example of a graph that shows the number of foxes and rabbits within a habitat. Here you can see that our number of rabbits increases and then decreases and then increases and decreases and follows that pattern all the way to the end of the graph. Same with the fox. The fox increases and decreases and does so 
all the way to the end of the graph. But there's more than that going on here. You can see that when the number of rabbits starts to increase, there's a bit of a delay, but then the number of foxes start to increase. Then the number of rabbits will start to go down. Then the number of foxes, after a bit of a delay, will start to go down. If we concentrate on our fox population here where it's nice and low, you can see that the number of rabbits is going up. That means there's going to be lots of rabbits for our foxes to eat. Because of this, the fox is more likely to survive and is more likely to reproduce, and so the numbers of foxes start to increase. But then you can see as the number of foxes gets higher, the number of rabbits start to decrease, because more foxes are going to need to eat more rabbits. When we get to this point here, there is not enough food to feed all of our foxes, so some of our foxes are going to die out. What I want you to do is to arrange these six statements at the side to describe the relationship between this predator and its prey. And I'd like everybody's first statement to be this statement here. If you've downloaded the worksheets, this is available as a cut and stick activity, but if you haven't got the worksheet, then you can just copy out the statements in the order you think they go in. And if you really want a challenge, I want you to explain why the maximum number of rabbits is greater than the maximum number of foxes. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you rearranged your statements? So we all started with when the population of rabbits is low, there is not enough food for all of the foxes. This means that the number of foxes is going to decrease. And when the number of foxes are low, then the rabbits are able to reproduce. This means that the number of rabbits is going to increase, which means there is now more rabbits for the foxes to eat, and the number of foxes is going to start to increase. The increased number of foxes need to eat more rabbits, and so the number of rabbits starts to decrease. This then will return to the beginning, and the cycle will repeat. For this challenge question, we're going to have a look at it in a bit more detail. And to do that, we're going to quickly recap some things from previous lessons. Here we have a food chain. What I want you to do is answer these three questions. What do the arrows represent? I want to know how much energy is transferred from one organism to the next. And I want to know why there is rarely more than five energy transfers in a food chain. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. And if you need more time, pause the video. And when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you recapped your answers? These arrows represent the transfer of energy. How much energy is transferred from one organism to the next? About 10%. Why is there rarely more than five energy transfers in a food chain? This is because there wouldn't be enough energy transferred to the apex predator. Next, we're gonna have a look at the first three questions on our worksheet. If you haven't got a worksheet, don't worry about it. All the data that you need and all the questions are gonna be displayed here. So thinking back to our recap, if only 10% of the energy is transferred from the rabbit to the fox, and our rabbit contains 3,874 kilojoules of energy, I want you to calculate the energy the fox receives from eating one rabbit. In order for a fox to survive, it needs to eat 21,000 kilojoules every week. How many rabbits would it need to eat to get 21,000 kilojoules? And I'd also like to suggest why the number of rabbits calculated for this question is higher than the actual number of rabbits eaten. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you finished? The amount of energy the fox is going to receive from eating one rabbit is going to be 10% of that 3,874 kilojoules, which will give us 387.4 kilojoules. If a fox needs to eat 21,000 kilojoules every week, how many rabbits would it need to eat? Well, if we take our 21,000 kilojoules, which is the total amount the fox needs, and divide it by the energy given by one rabbit, 387.4, that will give us 54.2 rabbits every week. Or we can round that to 55 rabbits per week. But why have we rounded up from 54.2? Because if we round it down, 54 rabbits would be too few for our fox, and you can't get 0.2 of a rabbit. So you need to eat 55 in order to meet this 21,000 kilojoule requirement. But the value is actually a lot lower than this, and that's because foxes have other food sources, like rodents and birds, frogs, worms and berries. Now we're going to look at the next two questions on our worksheet. If the foxes eat about 25 rabbits per year, 
What would happen if an ecosystem contained more rabbits than foxes? And if you want a bit of a challenge, over the course of a year, 96,000 rabbits and 3,650 foxes live in the county of Derbyshire. If each fox eats 25 rabbits during this year, will there be any rabbits left? I'm going to put 5 seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have we finished? So if the number of foxes was greater than the number of rabbits, and each fox needs to eat 25 rabbits per year, then the number of rabbits is going to decrease rapidly, which means the rabbits could be wiped out from this habitat. Now let's have a look if there's going to be enough rabbits for our foxes to eat in Derbyshire. Each fox needs to eat 25 rabbits. So if we take our number of foxes and times it by 25, we're going to get the total number of rabbits needed, which is 91,250 rabbits eaten. We then need to calculate the difference between the two, our 96,000 that we started with, minus 91,250 to give us 4,750 rabbits that would remain. But the number of remaining rabbits is actually going to be a lot higher. This is because the number doesn't include any new rabbits which have been born, and it doesn't account for any foxes which could have died throughout the year and haven't eaten their 25 rabbits. So now we have described the relationship between the predator and the prey. Next, I want to talk about these squirrels, and the number of these red squirrels started to drop when this grey squirrel was introduced. I want you to use the data on your worksheet to suggest how the grey squirrel outcompetes the red squirrel. If you haven't got a worksheet, then I'm going to put the data on screen. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you suggested how this grey squirrel is outcompeting this red squirrel? The grey squirrels have a more varied diet. This means they're more likely to find food, and because of that, they're more likely to survive and reproduce. Grey squirrels also produce bigger litters and have more than one litter per year. Because of this increase in number, more squirrels are going to survive and more squirrels are going to reproduce. And once these squirrels get past their first winter, then 50% of older red squirrels will die in the winter, whereas only 30% of the older grey squirrels die in the winter. This means there's going to be more squirrels surviving and more squirrels reproducing. Next, I want you to use the data in the table to calculate the largest possible body size of both our grey squirrel and our red squirrel. Our table contains the tail length for both squirrels, grey squirrels on the left, red squirrels on the right, and the total length for each of our squirrels. Then, using the figures used in these questions, I would like to calculate what percentage of these squirrels' total length is tail. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. If you've finished your calculations, in order to calculate the biggest possible body size for our grey squirrel, we are going to need to take our biggest total size and subtract our smallest tail size. So 52.5 minus 19.5 gives us 33 centimetres. To calculate the biggest possible body size for our red squirrel, we are going to need to take our biggest total size minus our smallest tail size. So 43 minus 15 centimetres gives us 27 centimetres. Using the same measurements as these two, the percentage of that grey squirrel which is tail can be calculated by taking its tail size and dividing it by its total size and multiplying it by 100. So we used 19.5 centimetres for our tail size and 52.5 centimetres for our total size. Divide one by the other and times by 100, that gives us 37.14% of our grey squirrel is tail. Calculating the percentage of the length that is tail in our red squirrel, again we're going to need to take our tail size divided by our total size, so 15 divided by 43, and multiply it by 100 to give us 34.88%. We've got two more questions I'd like us to do before we wrap this lesson up. If we've got 600,000 squirrels living within a habitat, I want you to use the data in the table to calculate how many of that 600,000 are going to survive their first winter, and I want you to use your answer from this question to calculate how many of those original 600,000 would survive their second winter. 
I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you finish we'll go through the answers together. Are we all done? Let's have a look at this population of 600,000 squirrels. In our first winter, 85% of grey squirrels will die, which means only 15% will survive. Next, we're going to take the 600,000, we're going to multiply it by that 15 and divide the whole thing by 100, which will tell us that 90,000 squirrels will survive. Now, how many of this 90,000 are going to survive their second winter? Only 30% of our older grey squirrels die during their second winter, which means 70% of them are going to survive. Next, we're going to take that 90,000 from our original answer, multiply it by 70 and divide it by 100 to give us 63,000 survivors. Which means we've only got one more task I want to complete before we wrap this lesson up and you get to choose what to do. You can either write a tweet about today's lesson, 140 characters long, and you can hashtag those keywords. You can write down two correct statements and one incorrect statement, or you can draw the most important thing you have learned today. I hope you've had a great lesson and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the lesson. If you found it useful, don't forget to press the like button. And why don't you subscribe and press the bell icon as well so you know when the next lesson's available. You can also support me on Patreon and you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and I appreciate all the support. I'll see you next time.